Okay, so we are now on Revelation chapter 11. If we can get through this chapter, we'll be halfway through the book. So I know it's exciting, right? It's only been about a year and a half now. So we're moving right along, right? Um, now, in our last chapter, chapter 10, there was an angel, a messenger from heaven that came down and proclaimed authority over the earth and the sea. Okay, put a foot on each and made a proclamation. And he had a book in his hand that was open. A book, and what did, what happened to that book? Does anyone remember? He ate it. John had to eat it, right? So he ate it, and it was sweet in his mouth like honey, but it made his stomach bitter because he still had a lot of preaching to do, especially even to those that would reject it, right? So he's going to go back to it before many people and preach the message. Now, John, he's left the presence of the throne of heaven, and he's come to earth, and he's told, I want you to measure the temple in Jerusalem. And that's where we pick up here in Revelation chapter 11. So verse 1 and 2 read, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court that is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot for forty and two months. Okay. So we are to this point where God, Jesus Christ, is going to come and claim what is his. God had given the earth to Adam and to Eve. He said to man, male and female, created he them, and he gave them dominion, right? Dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the uh, animals, all creeping things, etc. And unfortunately, what happened? Adam, the male and the female, Adam, deliberately disobeyed God. They chose to eat from the tree following Satan's temptation, right? So what happened? Well, now the throne sits empty on the earth until someone can redeem it. And that's the story we talked about with Jesus opening the scroll, right? So the devil or Satan or Lucifer, or whatever you want to call him, he became the God of this age, right? He's the prince of the power of the air is what the Bible describes him as. But Jesus has now opened the seals. He has now had the book. It's open. And he's coming back to take what's his. He's coming back because he has redeemed the earth and mankind. The only way he was able to do that was to become a man himself. A man must sit on the throne because that's who the earth was given to. So this chapter, we're going to see this switch from that heavenly viewpoint that we've talked about so far, right, of the tribulation, back to the earthly viewpoint. So the Jewish people, we recall that they were cast out of their land, right? from about 70 AD, they no longer had a nation to call home. Some lived in the area, but they had no nation of their own. And they were dispersed across the world. And then of course, in 1948, after the end of World War II, they had a nation reestablished in its historical, although not within the full boundaries that the Bible gives it, but within historical Israel. Now, now that the land has been returned to them, Jesus had promised they will dwell based on the boundaries he gave. He promised that he would fulfill his promise to them. That hasn't happened yet. Since Israel has been reestablished as a nation, ever since that time, people have been migrating. Jews, Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox Jews have been migrating back to Jerusalem, back not to Jerusalem, but to Israel as a whole, right? So a period of time that the Bible has called the time of the Gentiles is coming to a close. The time of Gentile kings ruling the world is coming to a close. The final Gentile king, what's his name? Well, we don't know his name. I wish we did. But he is the Antichrist, right? His title is the Antichrist, the Beast. Um, and uh, we're going to see the little horn. There's all kinds of names for him. And we're going to see that time of the Gentiles end whenever he finally is overthrown, right? This last bit of time, which we just read about in verse 2, right? It says it, that this courtyard of the temple is given to the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months, all right? That was in verse 2. This is telling us that the Gentiles are still dwelling in Jerusalem and still have power over the temple, right? Temple area. And guess what is the situation right now? That's still the case. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you cannot go to the Temple Mount where they believe the temple was supposed to be, right? Not to say where it's at. Some people have differing opinions on that. But you're not allowed to publicly pray. 
right? You're not allowed to mouth something or you'll be thrown out by the Temple Mount guards, right? Because they don't want to offend the other religious groups, the other Gentile groups, non-Jewish groups who are in the area. So this is proof that the time of the Gentiles is not yet over. We're still in that right now because the Gentiles continue to control parts of the city. One of the great pushes in Israel today, especially by the Orthodox Jew, is to rebuild the temple. They want to see it rebuilt. They want to see the Old Testament method of worship come back into play. So by the time you come to the time of the tribulation, we expect that the temple has been or is being built or at least ready to be built, okay? John is told during this first 42 months that there's a temple there, right? This is where they're treading it down. So the John said, measure this temple of God and the worshipers who are there using it. He's told that the court is to be left alone because it belonged to the Gentiles, who again would rule for 42 months or based on the biblical year would be three and a half years. So this courtyard remaining for the Gentiles tells us what? It tells us this is a literal temple on the literal earth in the literal Jerusalem. Okay, This is not some mystical, mythical thing. This is not some spiritualized thing. There's going to be a physical temple. This isn't the only place in the Bible where we find measurements, okay? If you go to Revelation 21, 15, there is a measurement of a future city, right? It's a big white city that has to do not only with Israel, but has to do with the church and all saved people, regardless of their nationality. The temple mentioned here in Revelation 11 has to do with the Israelite people who practice Judaism, and that is before that city comes down from heaven. Israel is an earthly people. They have earthly promises that started with Abraham that have yet to be completely fulfilled. The church, on the other hand, is a heavenly people made up of both Jews and non-Jews. Church are those born again by the blood of Christ. And they have a heavenly promise, again, that is being fulfilled and will yet be fulfilled. So Israel is a nation that will one day worship at the temple, once again, the temple during at least the tribulation. Christians, by definition, don't have anywhere special that they worship. There's not some place you go where you're closer to God. That's not how that works. How do we worship Jesus? In spirit and in truth. That's from John 4.23, where Jesus announces to the Samaritan woman, hey, the time's coming and now is, right? He says, but the hour cometh and now is, in John 4.23, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the context is clear. She's saying, do we have to go to Jerusalem? Do we have to go to the temple to worship? He says, no, it's in spirit, right? You can heal, he, is, he can hear you wherever you are. So at some point between now and the Great Tribulation, those last three and a half years of the Tribulation, we're going to see the Temple of Israel rebuilt. So if the historians are correct, and the book of Revelation was written after 70 AD, okay, they believe it was written uh, sometime after that, 90 AD, 100, somewhere in that range, um, that means that John can't be measuring the Temple of Herod. The temple of Herod was destroyed. John told us at the end times that the abomination of desolation would occur. The, the gospel of John, Jesus was speaking. That the, I'm sorry, the gospel, the gospel of Matthew said that at the end times, the abomination of desolation would occur just as Daniel had predicted. Well, Jesus lived after the first abomination of desolation happened. The first abomination of desolation was where a temple was desecrated. The temple of God was desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes about 200 BC. And he took this uh, this uh, statue of Zeus and put it in the Holy of Holies. And that led to the Maccabean revolt. So that seems like, well, wait a minute. We've already seen this. We've already... So during Jesus's time, when he talked about the abomination of desolation that Daniel was speaking of, people had thought that was a historical thing because it happened 200 years earlier. But Jesus talked about it, that it was yet to come. 
So even though there was a previous statue put in to the Holy of Holies, there was yet another one to come. And John keeps talking about it here in the Revelation as something yet future as well, which means that it can't have been in Herod's temple. This is not something that happened in 70 AD. Some people take the view that the whole book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD. That cannot be true. And again, most historians believe the book of Revelation was actually written after 70 AD, which again makes sense. So Jesus, this is Matthew 24, verse 1. He says, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, see you not these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, what's going to happen to this temple? It's going to be flattened, which is exactly what happened in 70 AD. Matthew 24, 14, a few verses later, says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore, right, so after this gospel has been preached to all nations, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So you see that the gospel had to be spread across the world. And had it happened by 70 AD? No, most of it was within the Turkey region, right? Within some of those churches and mainly in Jerusalem, maybe as far away as Rome, right? That's about as far as we got. So there's something more that has to happen. So Jesus said the temple was going to be destroyed. But then he said, at the end, the abomination of desolation will happen. Isn't that a contradiction? If the temple's gone, how can there be an abomination of desolation? Well, the temple may be gone, but it can be rebuilt. It's just a building of stone, right? So we see that that's the only obvious answer on how that temple could be there at the end times. So the Antichrist, he is going to use this second temple as part of the way he breaks the treaty or the covenant with Israel. So from Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it says, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So there's going to destroy the sanctuary. There's going to be desolations till the end of the war. And he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, so that final seven-year period, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So the sacrifices will be occurring for the first three and a half years. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation or the completion. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Then you go down to chapter 12, verse 11, says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Again, three and a half years. So there will be a temple. The temple will certainly be rebuilt, and they will certainly reinstitute worship there. And they'll be allowed to worship there under the Antichrist's, okay, we have a deal here for the first three and a half years, okay? So... Paul, the apostle, he expects the Antichrist to rebuild the temple. He expects the Antichrist to utilize the temple after the rapture. So what do we read? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by a letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, we're talking about the rapture, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So now we're talking about the Antichrist showing up, right? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all things that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So one of the hallmarks of the Antichrist is he will use the temple of God to institute worship of himself, right? 
So again, the end times, the Antichrist presence requires a temple to be there. All right. So based on scripture, a temple or at the very least a tabernacle, right? A tent version, a mobile version of the temple must stand again. You could build a temporary tabernacle tomorrow. You don't need years and years of construction. But I expect that they will build the physical temple because there is a big movement now. They've already collected the building materials. They've already reforged a lot of the furniture. They're just waiting for a location. And the architects are ready to go to fly in it and get ready, right? That's what they're ready to do now. It's important it's built on, this, on a certain spot then. It's important to them. Okay. It's built on a certain spot because yeah. it's based on the threshing floor that David purchased, right? And the question is, nobody's 100% sure where that spot is. So keep in mind, this is not the temple that God dwells in. This is what they think. So even if it was in the wrong spot, doesn't really matter. Now, do I think they'll probably find the right spot? They probably will. And probably that right spot will have to do with keeping uh, certain uh, other faiths, like the Muslim faith, some of their holy sites and their mosques that are there uh, intact. And that may be the temple being referred to that's in the courtyard, right? So again, all this will occur and we in Israel will resume its Old Testament worship of God. Now, again, there's all kinds of concerns about where and when, but that doesn't change that it will happen, right? The details aren't as important to us, but they will be important to someone. So for a period of time, at least three and a half years, the Orthodox Jews will be allowed to worship at this site. And that's very different than what they have today. Now they're lucky to be able to go to the Wailing Wall. It's a very different situation. So when the Antichrist arrives on the scene, he's going to enforce this covenant or this treaty. Uh, and he's there's going to come a time where they think, great, we have peace. We're good to go. But unfortunately, he's going to break that covenant three and a half years in. All right. And he's going to place that statue, most likely of himself, in the Holy of Holies. And the false prophet's going to tell people, look, you got to worship him. Look, the statue can speak and so on. And we'll talk more about that when we get there in Revelation. Okay. All right. So the most holy place, again, we talked about it in Daniel, talked about it in Revelation 13. Now, Jesus warns the people that are in Judea, when you see the abomination of desolation, get out of town, leave, right? And those that evacuate, they, they're free and God's going to actually keep them safe. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but once they're either evacuated or captured, the temple and all the surrounding areas for the next three and a half years is overrun by Gentiles, right? Overrun by the Antichrist and his lackeys during that time, okay? Now, I know it's a lot of background information, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it. So the original temple, who was the first one to build it? Solomon, right? Built by King Solomon after King David spent a ton of resources collecting all the materials they would need to make the most probably glorious building that's ever existed on the planet, okay? David, why was he not allowed to do it? Yeah, yeah, he was a he was a, a war uh, a warlike king. He had too much blood on his hands, essentially, right? So God says you're not to build it. So Solomon builds this magnificent temple for the glory of God to dwell in, right, in the midst of Israel. And during the reign of King Solomon, Israel was at its peak. It had the most power, the most like it overran any of its enemies. They wiped out, especially in the early years of Solomon. Now they thought that as long as the temple stood they would be invincible as a nation. They felt they were invincible and there was nothing that could hurt them. But they were given warning after warning after warning by the prophets that if they continued to live idolatrous lives, seeking after all these false gods, that God would have them taken away, that God would defeat them. And of course, we know that original, after Solomon, the nation split into two different nations. The northern kingdom eventually gets taken away by the Assyrians and dispersed. And then the southern kingdom, like, but we have the temple. But unfortunately, because of their rebellion, the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonians were empowered by God. Nebuchadnezzar was raised up by God and they were taken into captivity. And the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar because of the constant rebellion that happened in about 586 B.C. So in 541 B.C., those that returned started rebuilding it. But they didn't get to finish rebuilding it till about 516 BC, and that was called Zerubbabel's temple. So we had Solomon's temple. 
Now we have Zerubbabel's temple and it was nowhere near as nice, but it was larger. It was actually bigger in size, but nowhere near as expensive, ornate or fancy. Okay. And according to uh, Jewish tradition, Zerubbabel's temple did not have the Ark of the Covenant or the sacred fire that was never supposed to go out. Supposedly never had those things within it. Didn't have the Shekinah glory. The glory of God never indwelt it. This is again, according to Jewish tradition. Oh, okay. That's not scripture. That's not scripture. We don't have any of that. And they don't believe the Holy Spirit was there. And it did not have, again, according to Jewish tradition, the umum and the thumum, those two stones the high priest would use to help make uh, to determine the will of God. So that temple underwent the event called the abomination of desolation under Antiochus Epiphanes, right? That's when Zeus was put in the Holy of Holies. So that temple later fell into disrepair. And then Herod came along um, and he refurbished the temple. This is about 40 years before Christ was born. He refurbished the temple and he worked on it for a long time, right? It wasn't completed until 64 AD, six years before it was destroyed. Did you guys realize that? They were refurbishing it all that time, right? So everyone at that time was talking about how magnificent the temple was, right? That was when Jesus was walking the earth. They were so impressed with what it was, but they had never seen Solomon's temple or Zerubbabel's, right? They were seeing the refurbished Zerubbabel's temple now. So Jesus said, every stone's going to be taken apart. And that happened again, six years or seven years, I guess, 64 to 70, uh, after it was finished being built. Since then, the... Is it, is it, is it there? No. No, as far as we know, no. So um, so Jesus predicted, again, at the end time, there's going to be another temple, which, again, happens during the tribulation. So a lot of people call it the tribulation temple. So a temple is necessary for the end times. And that's why the Jews, they, unknowingly, that's why they're so fixated on rebuilding this temple. They strongly desire to do it. They literally just need the spot and they could start construction tomorrow. Temple that was there when Jesus lived was Herod's temple. It was Zerubbabel's temple being refurbished by Herod. Okay, then they—that's where they did the sacrifices. So they did Correct. the sacrifices. Yes, but the ark wasn't in there. The ark Correct. There. Right. Again, I no, the Bible doesn't tell us, but Jewish tradition and historians say no. Right. At least the ones I've read. Okay. Since Solomon's temple, far as we know, yeah. Now, uh, not to get into speculation, but there's a lot of um, uh, undercover groups that claim it's currently in Ethiopia. There's others who claim it was actually buried in one of the caves under near Jerusalem. Some people even say it was under where the cross was. A lot of that speculation, I don't put any stock into it at all. Not because it's not true, it's because it's speculation. And the Bible's silent on it, so so are we. That's kind of how I look at it, right? Um, so anyway... Oh, there's a lot of interesting possibilities. And they say, again, this, this and I, I don't want to get too far into speculation, but supposedly the person who said he saw it under the uh, cross, he actually, I know his name, but I'm not going to share that here. Um, the point is they supposedly saw some blood stained on it and supposedly had the blood tested and it only had 23 chromosomes. And I'm like, you know, that would all be fascinating, but really couldn't snap a picture. You know, I mean, it just seems a little... A little much for me. But again, who knows? God knows. So again, where is this temple going to be built? Some people speculate it'll be where the Mosque of Umar currently stands, right? Near the Dome of the Rock, maybe. That's the other possibility. Um, some people say it'll have a totally different location because they'll find some new historical fact that it wasn't actually there. It was down the way. Um, but at some point, it is going to be built. They're going to revert back to their Old Testament method of worship, right? Some Orthodox Jews today, they say we cannot rebuild the temple until the Messiah comes. That's when we should rebuild it, right? But that's not what the overwhelming majority want. Now, the Antichrist, we talked about before that he doesn't have to be accepted as the Messiah. He may be a total Gentile king, but he may certainly seem like a Messiah because he's coming to proclaim peace and enforce a covenant with Israel when it seems like the whole world is against Israel which is more and more what it seems like these days, right? But ultimately, he's going to show his true colors whenever he breaks that covenant with them. <clears throat> and they'll later figure out their true Messiah had already come. All right. So 
by trying to appease everyone in that area. We have all kinds of different religious groups in that area. Even whenever we say Jew and Muslim and atheistic and all these ones, there's many sects of each of those, right? So there's all kinds of different things. And you're trying to appease all of them. That's part of the peace that is attempted in that area under the Antichrist. So there's an agreement to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple without affecting the non-Jewish religions that are in the area. So it maintains the holy site to the Islamic world, not their most holy site, but just an important, you know, historical site to them. But um, and it also allows for the replacement of that holy site to the Jewish world. So as you might anticipate, this is not going to last very long, right? And that's why we say that the temple in Jerusalem itself will be trodden underfoot at that time, once the Jews have had this treaty broken and have escaped or were captured. So in the short history of Israel, it has been attacked from every side. There's really nowhere Israel hasn't been attacked by. After being born as a nation in 1948, it seemed like it was only going to last days before it was destroyed. But God has used nations of the world to protect Israel. He's used America. He's used England, right, to defend against communists and some of the Arab world and all these different things. But let's just keep one thing clear. If America and England and all these countries said, you know what, we're not going to protect Israel, God would continue to, perfect, to protect them, right? He has made a promise. He's going to make it happen. God uses the world to do his will. He even uses ungodly nations to do his will. So Babylon, remember when they captured Jerusalem and they enslaved the Jewish people? They thought, wow, it's because we're so great. We're so powerful. Nebuchadnezzar said, look what I've done. And God said, you didn't do a bit of that. I'm the one who allowed you to do all that. Don't forget who put you in your place. And he reminded him by a seven-year animal retreat, I guess you could call it, where he became a werewolf of sights. So uh, God will perform what he has promised. And as Christians, our goal is to see his will done, not to do it for him, right? We take part in what he calls us to take part in. We do what he asks us to do. And we use him as he wishes to use us. We owe him more than we can ever pay back, right? So that brings up the one other question before we move on past this. Should Christians be supporting the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem? I believe the answer is no, okay? Nowhere in the New Testament do you find any command to any of the church to support the rebuilding or the support of the temple or any of the Jewish synagogues or anything like that, right? Right? They did witness to those in the synagogues. They did share the gospel. They shared Jesus Christ. But you don't. when they would collect for the saints, they'd collect for the poor in the church. They wouldn't collect to support the Jewish uh, religious uh, system, right? Jesus made it clear that you would not be going to a temple to worship God. So we're supposed to be worshiping him in spirit and in truth, as we talked about earlier, right? So why would I support a building that I would never use to communicate with God as part of the church? Jesus points out that the temple of God for the church is actually made up of the believers. We find that in Ephesians chapter 2. We're told we're all stones fitly joined together, right? To be a spiritual building to God. Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit does not dwell in a temple made with hands. That's not where he's coming to dwell with us, right? He dwells in our hearts. So the only people who seek to rebuild the temple are those who are still looking for their Messiah. I have found my Messiah. I have found Jesus Christ, right? So the peace made during the tribulation is between Israel and the Antichrist, right? It's described in Daniel 9, 27, and it tells us it is a covenant with death and with hell, this peace treaty or peace covenant that he makes with them, right? There is a remnant of Jews that we talked about before, the 144,000, as well as the remnant who escaped, right? And the 144,000 are out preaching the truth. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus. But the majority of Jews at this point, even though they've run from the, from the Antichrist and his army, they have not yet turned to Christ. So again, this is not Jews who have accepted their Messiah already. The Messianic Jews, the Christians are part of the church. But we're talking about those who have not yet accepted him during this time of tribulation. So why does John need to measure the temple. I believe the reason he's told to measure it is to prove how inadequate it was, especially in comparison to the last guy who measured the temple. The last guy who measured the temple was Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 40, he measures a temple and it's massive, all right? That likely represents the temple that's in heaven, all right? It's that is built or brought, some people would say, or is brought down to earth during the millennium. So Ezekiel was in captivity. He was not even in Jerusalem. And he's given a vision after the temple was destroyed because it was in the latter half of his book, near the end of his book. So he sees a vision of a temple and it's huge. It's like a square mile. So that's why people expect it's either he was seeing the millennial temple or more likely the temple that's in heaven. <clears throat> and later in Ezekiel, what was that, Ginger, do you have a question? Later in Ezekiel, we see the sacrifices are reinstituted in this temple, which people are like, wait a minute. If this is the millennial temple, this is the temple that is brought from heaven to earth during the millennium or built during the millennium. Why on earth would we be doing sacrifices? I mean, was there any reason for that since the sacrifices all pointed to Jesus Christ? He likes steaks. <laughs> so some people have argued that it's a memorial, right? It's actually reminding us of the sacrifice of Jesus. So to that end, consider the fact that Jewish believers in Christ, Jews that have accepted Jesus Christ, right? They continued to observe Passover, which was a sacrifice. This is in the New Testament, right? So if you think of what Passover is, what is Passover a picture of? It was a picture pointing towards Christ. What does the Bible tell us about Passover? What does it tell about Jesus? He is our Passover, right? They continued to observe Pentecost, which was what? A sacrifice, right? They continued to observe the Feast of Weeks. They, so there's all kinds of feasts that still were sacrifices after Jesus came and died for their sins, was resurrected, and they accepted him as Savior, that they continued to take part. So that means Jewish believers, even in the early church, despite understanding these were all just pictures of Jesus Christ, continued to do them. So in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Paul clearly understood Jesus is our Passover, right? There's no question about that. Acts 12, verse 2, and talking about how uh, uh, Herod killed uh, James, says, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So they all had to be in Jerusalem during the days of unleavened bread. Acts 18, 21, this is Paul talking, he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So he had to keep the feast. This is again after Jesus died. Uh, Acts 20, 16, for Paul had determined to sail to by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible to him, to be at Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. There were required feasts that all Jews had to go to Israel for. Paul made every attempt as a born-again believer in the church, the same Paul who says, don't let people judge you on your days, to keep those feasts. And last one is Acts 27, verse 9, talking about the Day of Atonement. It says, now when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was, all, was now already passed, the fast for the Day of Atonement. So the idea of a millennial temple where their sacrifices are being performed is not inconsistent, where you have these memorial sacrifices, is not inconsistent with the scriptures. It's actually fairly consistent with the scriptures. So Israel, as we talked about earlier, has a covenant relationship with God and has a special destiny, special promises, and a special destiny during the millennium where they get to dwell versus the church. There's some different things that Israel has that the rest of the church does not have. So we are grafted in, no question. But the purpose of the tribulation is what? One is one of the major purposes? To bring Israel back to God, right? To complete the covenant that was promised them. But he can't fulfill the covenant till they come to him in faith. That was part of the deal, right? So finally, at long last, back to our measurements. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's another good one. Very good. They are also trusting those who dwell on the earth. But now we get to, let me see what the chat says. Okay, I think I, I missed the earlier uh, statement, but that's uh, he's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, 
Hebrews 9, 11 and 12, 23 and 24. We'll pull that up here in a few minutes. Dale shared a chat with us. Okay, so when we get to our measurements here, we see a reed is used to measure the temple. Now, this reed, this idea of a reed used to measure, we're going to find that it's the same reed that's being used or the same idea of a reed being used to measure the heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that comes out of heaven, which is mind-bogglingly huge. I mean, to understand the size of this thing is hard. I'll try to put it in perspective here. So in Revelation 21, 15, this is about Jerusalem, not the temple. It says, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth foursquare and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and the height of it are equal. That's a lot of furlongs, right? So 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 furlongs, which is equivalent to 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. So the base of this city is 2,250,000 square miles. The New York City, big city, right? Have you been to New York before? 300 square miles, okay? How about the total land mass of the United States? is 3.8 million. The landmass of New Jerusalem is 2.25 million. Do you get how big we're talking? A city that's all that's as big as some continents, okay? Like consider Australia-ish size, not quite that big, but it's essentially about the same. So this is a massive city, right? So hey, now to this one, Herod's temple, which John had seen, was severely lacking compared to this true temple that's in heaven that we saw from Ezekiel, right? So there is a temple in heaven, by the way. There is definitely a temple in heaven. And everything that was built on the earth all throughout history, including Solomon's temple, was based on the model that was from the heavenly temple. And no, God will not need the temple to dwell with us. The purpose of the temple is because God couldn't, we couldn't be in his presence, right? But there is a time coming where he will be able to be in our presence because we've all been washed clean, right? So Revelation 15, 8 says, and the temple was filled with smoke. This is the temple in heaven. I'm just pointing out there is a temple in heaven. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of the Lord and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. We'll read about that later. But in Revelation 21, 22, we see in the new Jerusalem, this massive city, it says, I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So we see that there will be a dwelling of God with his people and the need for a temple is in there because we're all priests, right? We're all a kingdom of priests. So it's going to be an amazing time. So now John has measured his temple. It's not looking great during the tribulation. It's not a great temple. So now we get down to what's going to happen during this first three and a half years from the earthly perspective, remember, all that stuff from heaven as we've opened the seals, as we've blown the first six trumpets, all this stuff's going on. Now on earth, what has been happening? So in verse 3 through 5 of Revelation chapter 11, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. All right, I'm going to stop right here before we talk about these verses. We'll take a five-minute break, and then we'll pick up here in these uh, verse 3 through 5 again.